All the leaves are brown and the skies are grey. And we're back for season two of Somewhere to Believe in, the podcast brought to you by Greenbelt Festival. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Paul. So we're back with episode two of our new podcast. Back with episode two, back in a lockdown. <laughs> back in a lockdown. Same old, same old. It wouldn't feel right doing a podcast without being in some form of lockdown. I don't know what we're going to do in the future if ever we get through this. I wonder if anybody would listen if they've got better stuff to do. How about you, Catherine? Are you, are you dreading it? You know, when I, I live in the West Midlands in the black country, so we I was about to go into a tier two lockdown before they mentioned the whole nationwide lockdown. And I panicked, had a little bit of a cry. And that lasted for a few days. And now I'm like, all right, it's happening. Let's get to it. Decided I might learn knitting, bought a new book. Bring it on. You are locked down ready. Yeah. <laughs> We've just um, been selling tickets for the festival. We've gone through our early bird ticket deadline, all that sort of stuff. And sales are going really well. People are buying tickets as if they they want to buy a little piece of hope in the future. And um, in a way, the more we go into lockdown, the more I'm anticipating and hopeful for being back in that field. Yeah, I've started to miss recently. I've started to really miss dancing because uh, I haven't danced for... You know, I'm not a professional dancer and I don't do dance lessons, but I just mean like dancing to live music or, you know, being in those kind of environments. I haven't danced for about six, seven months and I'm really missing it. There's something a bit sad about that. Talking with the artists is making me remember the sort of space that we're so careful to build and... We hope that people are enjoying these conversations with some of our artists who we've we've grown to love over the last few years. But as well as booking these artists, and that takes a long time and careful consideration, we put a lot of care, don't we, Catherine, into the way that we welcome those artists on site and the way that we, quote unquote, look after them. Um, tell us a little bit about the sorts of things that we do to make these artists feel really at home at Greenbelt. You know, we have the luxury of spending the year to put this festival together and we have a lot of venues and a lot of things to book. But with each person that we bring, we bring to the, we bring them to the festival knowing that our audience will like them, but also that they might really like our festival. And one of the things that I really want to try and get across to our artists is what our festival is about. I don't want them to be shipped in and shipped out and to never see what we're trying to create there. So me and all of my backstage volunteers and artist liaison volunteers, of which there are quite a few and they're absolutely incredible, we try and give all those artists a sense of the community as soon as they walk on site. And we do it, we do it in like little ways. Like me and Paul will write a letter to all of the artists kind of explaining what we're trying to do in the festival, explaining what they're part of. We... The canopy venue, Roger, every time a music artist walks on stage, they walk on stage to a soundtrack of carefully researched music that is all of their favourite music. Roger will research all their favourite music, make a playlist, and that's the music he will play before they're set. Um, we'll find out if it's their birthday, we'll buy them birthday cake, we'll make sure their food is great. It might be their first time on a festival site. They might be there by themselves. We'll give them like a friend who will help them and guide them around and just be there for them. We have a beautiful like community space for our artists, which on the walls we put information about our angels, information about our festival. On the tables where they have their food, there'll be little things on the tables which will talk about different festivals. We'll have posters from festivals gone by. So we just take extra care in showing them what our event is and in welcoming them. I have actually, I have a really lovely story about um, Lee Baines and the Glory Fires with the last time that, who we just did the podcast with, the last time they were on the festival site, they'd arrived, I think they'd arrived really early in the morning from the Netherlands where they'd done a gig and two of them were really tired and they were staying in one of our glamping tents. And um, 
they went down to go and have a nap in the middle of the day and one of my artist liaison volunteers brought them two cups of hot chocolate to go to bed with. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that kind of like hospitality, that welcoming that we find really important to make sure that our artists feel included in what we're creating. Yeah, and, and you do such a great job of that, Catherine, working with the volunteer teams that we have. And our volunteers are amazing, aren't they? They, they go way over and above. They, they make it their life's work over that weekend to do everything that they can. And we're so incredibly grateful. But I think, you know, behind that does sit your real vision and ethos for how can we make these artists feel more than they're just popping in to do a performance and then they're going home but more like they're being included into and welcomed into a community we want them to feel sort of a lasting connection to who we are and to remember it with fondness and to think oh yeah that festival uh, yeah i really love that vibe there i love that the whole thing that they're trying to do and i think our experience over the years is that invariably i can't think of a single bad experience actually invariably artists do go away with that sense of Oh, I was I'm really pleased that I came here. Yeah, and they tell their agents, they tell their friends, they tell other people to come to our festival and yeah, people rave about the way that they've been treated and you know, it, it's not it's 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 not a, a big thing for us to do, it, but it's a lovely thing for us to do. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking to um Josie Long. Oh, wonderful wonderful woman wonderful comedian so some people might not have heard of Josie or know too much about her what what sort of rough headlines can we give people that will help them into this Catherine I think I, I read a um, a quote by Owen Jones that said Josie Long isn't just somebody that talks about social justice she gets stuff done and I like that and that's true because she is a comedian but she also has uh a wonderful charity called Arts Emergency, which is helping young people um, have access to careers in the arts, giving them mentorship, giving them help and guidance, especially in areas where that might be a bit difficult. She's an artist, a comedian who we've wanted to bring to the festival for a long, 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 long time. We managed to get her to come in the end in 2015. Um, we've loved her work. Everything about her work made us think, do you know what? she would be perfect at Greenbelt and she would love Greenbelt. And as you'll hear in the conversation, it turns out that that did happen to be true. Plus, she's hilarious. She's brilliant. She's just so good at her job. She's so funny. She's so wonderful. So perfect for Greenbelt. I should say that very near the beginning of the conversation with Josie, while we were getting settled in, uh, one of her headphones fell out. And so there's a little bit of rustling while she rescues that from her desk and puts it back into her ear. Um, but stick with it. It's very, very, very short lived. How has your summer been? How, how has it been through this pandemic and through this lockdown for you? Um, well, I was in lockdown in a very small flat in London with my partner and my two-year-old. Uh, and so it was very much uh, an intense and difficult experience. Like we'd gone from our daughter just going for the first time sort of to nursery regularly. And so both of us kind of starting to claw back a bit of creative and work time to suddenly being trapped in a space that was far too small for us. Um, and on top of that, we were just before lockdown we'd finally after years and years of saving and trying we'd got uh, an offer agreement in principle uh, for a mortgage and so we were hoping to go and look at places and move to Glasgow and it was literally the week of lockdown that we were due to be going up and looking and so it really felt like obviously it was not a personal thing but it felt really like why have they personally targeted us at this Why crucial me? time? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit of an intense time. Um, and it was hard in some ways not to be like, this is exactly the place I didn't want to be. Um, not that I don't didn't want to be with my daughter or anything like that, but the specifics of our housing. It really kind of made me 
treat my surroundings with a bit more um, gentleness and kindness. So me and my daughter especially would be going on little walks. We we live next door to a, a little nature reserve uh, space. And so we just would end up seeing swans go from an egg to a swan over the course of the summer and seeing little moorhens and coots going from like nest building to egg laying to eggs hatching and trying to find snails and ants and so it kind of our focus my focus went to very small everyday natural things every day which is cool that was a nice part of it um taking my daughter to explore the same kind of woods and the same little walk by the canal and stuff. Uh, aside from that, I got, I, I did a lot of streaming, a lot. I, I, me and my friend Robin Ince do a podcast together um, called Book Shambles. And about three days after the pandemic hit, we were like, right, we need to stream all the time. <laughs> so we, we basically streamed the daily morning show for about eight weeks, 10 weeks, forever. And at the time I was a bit like, this is not a sign of good health. But <laughs> now I think it really got us both through it because it gave us structure to our lives and let us kind of perform. Um, I've done a lot of performing online. Um, and how is that, since- Josie? How, how is the perf- I can understand how it gives you structure and it enables you to sort of like do what you do. But in terms of the, that performative experience, what, what is that like online? It's like 10% as good, honestly. Like for me... I love to be in the room with people. I love that experience. It's my favourite thing and it's the thing that I've practised and worked at and I just love doing it so much. And so, like, it's fun enough, It's but I never wanted to be somebody who broadcasted from their bedroom into a computer. Like, if there's one thing I really <laughs> have a lot of mistrust for, it's the internet and doing things online. And I've it's kind of the source of where I've had a lot of traumatic experiences. So like, it's really harsh to be like, great, I have to go online to do this. Um, but that having been said, it, it, it's been worth it to try like every week for about three months, I was performing my tour show just live at the camera. And it, it was fun to connect with people in that way. And people would always chat. And it was it's funny what you get used to. So I got really into seeing the chat scrolling up on the screen and like people writing like ha 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 in the chat <laughs> became a big source of gratification for me. I'd be like, oh, people have said ha ha ha. <laughs> people having all those copy and pasted little sort of emojis and phrases yeah. ready so they can just whap them straight in. <laughs> yeah, and it was, I mean, that was, it was what I clung on to. I, I've got a friend called Bilal Zaffer and he um, has been doing some absolutely wonderful inventive stuff on Twitch where he improvises whole shows and does really, really funny and sophisticated things. So creative and I admire it so much and I wish I was better at it, but it's it's a funny thing. Like I've been touring stand-up for nearly, you know, for 15 years and I just, that's what I love to do and it's really hard to give up that ghost. Yeah, I've been trying to be as adaptive as possible, but also trying to give myself a break because I think people who found this period, not below, but like people in general who found this period very creative, I'm like, you're a scab (laughs) and (laughs) you need to languish with the rest of us. Like I I have this joke about if somebody's like, oh, I've written a novel during lockdown. I'm like, I don't want to read that novel. because that novel is going to be about someone who does not have empathy for other human beings. He doesn't have the good sense to despair when things are difficult. I've just been, I've been trying to temper a lot of feelings of like feeling very adrift and very much like everything is difficult because all my world is on hold at, at the least. But yeah, and just try and be as creative as I can be, <laughs> but not be like, I'm a failure if I can't do it because I feel like it's hard. I think that's a really good thing to think about during the lockdown because I remember people were saying that a lot at the very beginning, like you don't have to do anything. If all you do today is get up, sit by the telly and go to bed, you're good. (laughs) You're good. Yeah, and also 
people who have the luxury of not having like a preschool child in the house, I feel like if they didn't lie around <laughs> and relax a lot, they're letting me down. <laughs> like live that for me because I wish to and I cannot. Like, I don't know, people getting up at 6 a.m. to do a power hour before the day starts. Like, no. My sister's very into that kind of thing. She's got this sort of book and the book's like, if you don't care enough about your dreams to get up at 5 a.m. every day, you know, you're never going to achieve them. And I'm like, oh, mate, come on. Come on. If you get up at 5 a.m., you're going to be way too tired to achieve them. So yeah. relax. <laughs> what, what do you think? So uh, all the arts have kind of struggled through this time, but there's been a lot of kind of funding that's come out for a lot of arts organisations to get them through. And it seems like comedy might have been missed out of that equation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not fully up to date with it. Um, the Live Comedy Association has been amazing and been really advocating for us. But, um, yeah, I've definitely seen some comedy venues who've just not been eligible. And they have all these really, really outmoded criteria with which to judge about what is and isn't commercial and whether that means something and, you know, what should or shouldn't be supported. And I really think that, like, comedy is such a massive thing it's a massive industry it's a massive community and it's a big deal in terms of how much it puts out there and how many comedy clubs there are and, and how accessible it is for people of all backgrounds and so yeah I really wish that there was better handled support but I mean from my viewpoint I mean we're we're being run by the worst possible people at the worst possible time. So, Yeah, in one of our um, podcast episodes in the summer, we were talking to a geographer called Danny Dawling, and he was saying... Oh, I love him. Oh, yeah. I named the stand-up show after one of his chapters in a book, ah, The Future is Another Place. He's an incredible writer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was saying, he was saying, look, have a little bit of sympathy because the whole government and the whole cabinet has been elected on the basis of doing one thing, and that is Brexit. And now they've got something <laughs> way, way bigger to do. So I remember that did stick in my mind, in a, and I've tried to cling on to it in a vague attempt to feel some form of empathy for their struggles. The thing is, it's difficult. I'm though. proud of you guys, and I think that's very, you know, <laughs> that's what Jesus would do, and I'm proud of you guys. But I, I'm with you, you know, Josie. I, <laughs> Um, yeah, so sorry, back to your point. Um, it's been a real shame. I've definitely seen already a couple of art centres go under and there's been a lot of talk of when furlough ends, how catastrophic that'll be. Yeah. And it is really, it, it, it's terrifying. And, and it's such a shame because it's just a waste and unnecessary. Mm. Um, winding right, right back in time, Joe, so you said that you've, you know, you've been doing stand-up for 15 years or more. You know, more. We were reading that you, know, you began doing stand-up in some shape or form when you were at school as like a teenager. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, what did that look like? How did you get into it? Um, there was a local workshop as an art centre, which has since been closed by a local Conservative government. And um, I did the stand-up workshops with um, adults. I don't think I was supposed to be on it, but I was 14 and my mum was like, oh, you'd like doing that. So I did love comedy growing up and loved watching TV comedy. And then, um, yeah, just started to perform. And when they would book stand-up gigs, they book me a spot as well. And I would go along with them and just have this incredible double life where I'd be at school the next day having done gigs. And, and the best part is, I think, when you're really young, you just, firstly, you don't feel the fear. Like, people always go, oh, I wouldn't have done that when I was a teenager. And I'm like, you you probably would have. Like, your brain is hardwired when you're a teenager to make you make irrational and bold decisions. So it's actually the perfect time because you don't understand the consequences. And also... Um, yeah, uh, um, you don't really, I didn't really differentiate between three people above a pub and like a thousand people in the theatre. So any gig I got would be kind of approached with the same excitement and would be as much of a thrill. Um, so it was really fun. I used to gig quite a lot as a teenager. And um, when I went to university, I set up some sort of fun comedy clubs where we would go around lots of different university buildings and do anarchic nights and then get thrown out and have to find a new venue because we'd broken a table or we'd <laughs> thrown pizza at the wall or something like just such like very, very tame things. But 
yeah and then when I left university that was when I was like right I'm gonna gig every single night <laughs> and I'm gonna just see whether I can try and make it as a professional um and here I am <laughs> alone online <laughs> Who were your Who were your comedy inspirations? You said you know you liked watching comedy on TV, and wh- where did you? Who were the comedians, and what were the forms of comedy that that really got you got you going? So I really loved um, Monty Python. I would watch Monty Python with my dad, and although there was quite a controversy about it, controversy I can never remember which one is the English way of saying it, um, because my dad is quite religious, and I wanted to watch Life of Brian, and it was forbidden in the house. And then when I did watch it, I was a bit like, oh, I feel like this isn't actually sacrilegious. Like this is kind of just like. A bit of fun, but yeah, it was a big deal. That was a, that was a forbidden thing, um, uh, and um, yeah, we loved watching. We watched the series mainly and the Holy Grail, and I love Vic and Bob. That was a real thing that I found when I was a kid. And um, then uh, in the nineties, it's like League of Gentlemen. I really loved and Lee and Herring. Um, so I was very lucky because when I was twenty two, uh, Stuart Lee actually took me to support him on tour, and it was just like. I could not believe the luck of that, like to be sort of sat watching and touring with someone who I'd like admired so much as a teenager. And yeah, it was a real kind of apprenticeship. Often when people uh, serve apprenticeships, they end up becoming quite like the person they sort of served under, I guess. And, but your, your comedy and persona is so, it's like the virtual opposite of Stuart. Perhaps. I don't know. I think we're different kinds of clowns, definitely. Like I'm somebody who, in the like traditional clowning sense, is like more of a, like a naive clown. So I just can't help it. The way I am is very much like, wow, look at this. Whereas he's definitely like a fussy old August clown who's like, no, 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 no. Um, but I think I definitely, I felt like I learned a lot from him in terms of how you put a show together and thinking a lot about the through line and the narrative of a show and and trying to sort of really, really hone the writing of it and what a show might talk about or answer. And also just in terms of touring, like he was so generous and he would pay for my accommodation and pay for my dinners and stuff, just completely looked after me. And so I really took that on. When I started touring, I was like, you got to pay the support, you got to pay the accommodation. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I think we have sort of some similar outlooks in some ways. Like he said when we were on tour, he was like, oh, you have some of the sensibilities of like, someone from the early 80s and I was like yes yes I do I do not know how I've got these (laughs) but I do um yeah he's he's a really cool friend and I still really admire him but I tell you what's um the other people because I went to Edinburgh to the festival when I was 17 and that was like a real life-changing thing for me I I hadn't didn't even know it what it was had never been and I was in comedy competitions uh with David O'Doherty who's an Irish stand-up who um I was 17 he was about 23 and I remember sort of really meeting him had this massive impression on me because he was such a cool adult and we became friends and again he sort of took me under his wing a bit and just being like this is what life can be like this is what a creative life can be was really thrilling he's somebody who plays a lot of creative games and is very very playful uh in his daily life and i think that's something i've always kind of admired and treasured about how he is it's amazing that you were having those experiences so so young in your profession yeah it was lucky yeah really lucky Although I think I just front-ended it. Like, the last few years, I haven't really been up to much, so <laughs> got, it all, got it all done. And then people got bored of me. Um, uh, yeah, it was very, very lucky, and I really, really loved it at the time. So I feel glad that I really did appreciate it as it was happening. It seems like that might have fed into your... You started, you started an organisation about 10 years ago called Arts Emergency, and do you think your experiences having that mentorship so young is what got you to start that company? Um, it was actually almost the opposite, only because because it's kind of more an academic mentoring thing. I, like, I suppose, yeah, well, Stuart, it did really help me and take me under his wing. But, like, 
it was more when I was at university um, and my, my friend Neil, uh, with whom I s started the organisation, we both uh, came from backgrounds where when we got to university, it was something of a culture shock. Um, we would have really, really done with some continued support, I think, a little bit. And we basically realised that we got to a point when we were about kind of 29, 30, where we'd established ourselves to the extent that we really, really wanted to try and give some of that back and see what we could do to people that we imagined were kind of 18, 19, and sort of give them what we didn't have and what we'd hoped for. So I think I thought, oh, I've been very lucky insofar as that I can make a career from what I love. I said, definitely, I should like try and share that and pass that on. But I suppose I didn't really put two and two together about that experience of touring with Stuart. Um, I guess I would like more of it always. Like, it'd be so great just to have, always have someone be like, let's talk this through. <laughs> <laughs> and there's definitely not enough of that in the creative arts at all. Um, you're very lucky if you find somebody who is the right kind of person to help you. So so much of it is, is lonely and um, uncharted. And so, yeah, we definitely wanted to kind of see what we could do to sort of throw back do the opposite of pulling the ladder up basically push the ladder down and um, make sure the ladder was there yeah and also I, I, if I'm honest it was a reaction to the change in government as well I, I sort of was very very deeply politicized by that and especially by the student um, demonstrations at the end of 2010 uh, and the increase in tuition fees the um, cutting of the block grant that funded arts and humanities things like that like I'll never forget them. And they did kind of permanently radicalise me <laughs> to try and do something. And I think that you've always, whenever I've heard you talk about the importance of the arts, I think that you're somebody that has described it the best that I've heard somebody. Oh, wow, thank you. It's Because it's really oh. hard to put how important and how useful they are into words when you're trying to kind of sell the arts to people that might just think it's a fun playtime thing or a hobby or... Well, it's hard when people's worldviews are different to your own. Like one of the, we have a manifesto with Arts Emergency and one of the tenets of it is we have things that, oh, I'm going to misquote myself, but we have things that are bigger and better than money. Uh, and we have, there are things in this world that are bigger and better than money. We have things that people in power will never understand. And it's hard because if you're dealing with people who are so entrenched in a kind of capitalist mindset that every conception of value that they have is attached to financial value. It's really hard to say, well, this is kind of about humanity and what's humane. And like Kurt Vonnegut says, ways to make your soul grow. Like it, this isn't simply put into a box that you can see value on a ledger. <laughs> Um, but what's ironic is that, like, even by their terms, prior to the pandemic, the arts in this country were one of the few sectors where we were punching above our weight. Um, and it's funny, too, because I still see the arts as quite an open entry thing. Uh, in principle, everyone is an artist. Everyone creates. Everyone can and should be encouraged to participate at whatever level. But I also know that the arts are, are one of the hardest for social mobility. They're one of the hardest for people to actually get a foothold and progress if they're not from an upper class background. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, there's there's a lot to fight for more than ever. Um, I have a friend who's a screenwriter and I was moaning to her because she's my friend and I'm allowed. And she was like, now's the time more than ever to build beautiful things in defiance. And I was like, oh my God. It, it's interesting, Josie, hearing you speak of that, that political passion and the way you've been politicised and the, the values that, that you have. You know, you'd, you'd think that they would make you really, really cross and ranty. Um, and yet you always come across as so gentle and hopeful. It's, uh, oh, wow. Well, that's very kind. Well, uh, I mean, I think you probably haven't seen my Twitter, which <laughs> I don't think comes across that way, um, to the detriment of my career. But um, I, it's interesting. I've definitely made a few shows that are about wrestling with feelings of anger and about trying really hard to explain that, yeah. like, I'm not an angry person and I don't want to be angry. I want to kind of 
enjoy life and to build something better but it's very hard to keep keep going in the face of what feels to me torment and like I, I didn't fully appreciate that I was very complacent growing up uh under a different type of government like I think growing up, I just assumed that we were en route to living in a social democracy that would build and build and build. And I just didn't really appreciate, like, Thatcher's zombie powers <laughs> come and <laughs> bite us all. Um, so, yeah, I um, I think it's a hard thing to temper. And I think, you know, it's not just anger, it's feelings of despair sometimes, you know, especially, you know, you try and you fail. That's so hard. We all tried, not, you know, me and my friends tried so hard the last kind of two elections to try and elect a government that we thought would be more humane and we weren't able to do it. And that is bitter. Like, that is a bitter pill to swallow, especially when ever since then people have blamed the people who tried for it <laughs> and not the people who perhaps did not try or tried to harm and it's been really a horrible thing to have to sit with and you know especially now when these horrible things are happening in government and around us and you just sort of sit there thinking we tried so hard for things to be different to this and we didn't succeed like yeah trying to keep a part of you that still dares to dream and trying to keep some peace in your heart and a bit of like generosity and solace Oh my gosh, it's a real challenge. But um, I would say there having a two-year-old is very helpful because you're just swept along by their enthusiasm for life and you sort of know that you're committed to them and their life and their future. I would also say, I mean, I'm an absolute splitter because I'm moving to Scotland so that I can live in a new country <laughs> and, and not not live in the same country. So... We were speaking to um, another one of our artists in America, and obviously we've got the American elections coming up soon. And yeah. we were ask, and he's been somebody that's been fighting um, his political system for you know ten, fifteen years. And we said to him, you know, what do you think if Trump wins? And he said, I don't think political change now would come from from our politicians, from our president. It's changes never come that way. It's always come from the people. And at the moment now, the people are starting to come together and demand more than they've done in the last, you know, 10 years. If you'd have told me 10 years ago that I, that looking around the world, I would see more and more people saying that capitalism is destroying the planet and that um, we we can't just tinker with capitalism and hope that everything is going to sort itself out and that, you know, market ideology is failing. I'd have been like, yeah, I mean, I love it. Don't get me wrong, but that's just me and my three pals. And like to see the fact that kind of so many younger people and it's material circumstance, you know, like material conditions have got harder in the past sort of 10, 20 years. And so people can't just get more conservative as they get older because they're not enjoying any of the fruits of that um but i think it's heartening for everyone to see each other trying and like in particular for me like seeing younger people fighting climate change is the most beautiful and wonderful thing and i had it uh, in a show once i can't even think where i got it from this phrase that despair is a luxury and actually it, it, you can't just sit there being like oh i give up because it's so uh, uh selfish when you look around to kind of younger people and uh, other people who are just they can't escape struggles like i feel very lucky that i'm able to move house to somewhere that i think is possibly going to lead to a slightly happier life for me and I think that's not the case for everyone and so you can't really go oh it's too bad Ooh, you have to be like right okay but then I think it's funny too because I've definitely tried through my work to speak about these things but the people I admire are people who devote their lives to these things actually on a day-to-day -day basis
not me who's like sitting in an office being like, what do I think and feel about this? <laughs> like, cool. <laughs> yeah. I would say you're putting yourself down a, a bit by saying that because it feels like <laughs> you also have devoted a large part of your life to speaking your mind. And, and, and you said before it was to the detriment of your career. And we speak to a lot <laughs> of artists that, you know, at some point in their career will come up against this. You need to keep quiet and toe the line if you want to be really successful or keep doing what you're doing and have less success but be honest with yourself have you ever come up against that well I'm not even totally sure I do remember when I first started to talk about politics somebody took me aside and was like you I mean you're making a really bold choice here and it's gonna have ramifications and I was like what are you talking about now I'm like it's coming out and quite clearly expressing a political stance and viewpoint is actually I think somewhat dangerous even within something like comedy which is wild to me everyone's path is different and I think I'm somebody who even not to do with politics I find it really I'm I don't have much guile I'm not somebody who can conceal what they'd like to do I, I I'm not very good at playing the game to get a result or like uh, doing something because it's a means to an end. I like doing things as ends in themselves and I don't find it easy to conceal what I'm really thinking or feeling. Um, and I don't actually find it very easy to do things creatively that I don't have heart and soul commitment to. And so um, as a result, I think it puts you on a peculiar path. In my experience and opinion, I love the fact that I can create my own work and know that it's completely true to how I feel and to my worldview and things like that. The comedy landscape has possibly or probably changed quite a lot since you first did your stand-up in school. I mean, you, and then you talked about university organising those little club nights where you got thrown out for throwing pizza at the wall or whatever. And it, it feels like you like those small room um, traditional comedy club type settings and atmospheres whereas you know the comedians now they play stadiums and they do stadium tours they're rock stars yeah I mean uh, I'm like, don't get me wrong in my life I've never ever turned down a stadium tour and I've never even turned down the idea of it I just think you sort of can't escape what you are and I do love DIY uh, things I mean I play to quite big not quite big I play to theatres and I play to kind of 700 800 people yeah. when i tour not everywhere you know it's not going to be 700 people in winchester let's be real but um I, <laughs> that's the nicest I, place I, to I live am... in the whole of the country apparently it always comes top of the polls is it and they don't want to go out no, that's it. It. they're happy as yeah. they are um, but i i you know like i do have a touring circuit of my own that i have built and i really believe that it's possible to build kind of steadily and organically over a, a long career um but yeah, stadiums are not for me. It always boils down to I hate the experience of going to a stadium. It feels really like you're paying a hundred pounds to watch someone on TV who's two miles away. And so I think you can't help but bear out your feelings. And so like I I mean it's not something I'm ordering from the universe. Also, like, I don't know. I I, I have this really funny thing where I sort of want to just try and be as normal as possible and just try and live a very normal life. I don't like the idea of trying... I'm not, I'm not trying to, like, save up for a mansion so that I can hide from being... No, I don't know what I'm... I think I sound like a prick no matter what I say. And also, like, I'm just not good enough. Like, if I was more mainstream, I'd play stadiums, but I'm not. I'm too weird. And I look weird. And, like, you know, it's all those things. I think it's bad value. And also, it's creepy, You've got 100,000 people and one person. And it's like the epitome of, like, capitalism. It's like one person, like, sucking all the money <laughs> to themselves. <laughs> and the beer is um, always well, expensive. I, and Yes, yeah, and bad. queuing and everything, yeah. Yes. It's hard. It, it, yeah. I mean, it's definitely not the sort of thing I like. So I do quite like performing in the kind of venues I do because it's the kind of venue that I like seeing things in. Because in one hand, I'd say, yeah, it's my ethos that I disdain these things. But on the other hand, you know, they're not they're not banging down my door. Like, I'd love to do it if I was good enough, maybe. <laughs> or it, that's a thing. This is genuinely a thing to talk about with regard to creative careers is that I think it involves a lot of resilience and a lot of staying power and a lot of trying to temper 
feelings of fear and ego and things like that because you know I've been doing this for a long time and I've had periods where everything was going my way and I've had periods where nothing was going my way and there's nothing else I want to do and I love my work and I get as much satisfaction from doing a good gig not a bad gig but I get as much satisfaction from doing a good gig in front of 30 people than I do from doing a good gig in front of 3,000 people really it's the same buzz I'm always going to be someone for whom the pleasure is doing it I, I love writing I love performing the scale is not important to me and the joy comes from it as a thing I um, it would always be nice to have more people interested and to have more success and to have people wanting to commission my scripts and pitches that I'm putting out but the truth is the important thing for me is to keep going and to acknowledge that like a creative life is 90% people taking your work and rejecting it or not choosing you or telling you that someone else is better than you, you know? And you just get better at trying to filter it out and or just accepting sometimes you're going to feel jealous or sad or like a failure and you can talk to a friend about it and eat a chocolate bar and then you'll feel better. Do you, um, do you think that... Uh any topics are off limit when it comes to comedy? No, I don't. I think that certain types of behaviour will face pushback. <laughs> like, if you're going to be horrific and abusive to people on stage, you will upset people and they will push back. What frustrates me is there are people who are deliberately cruel, inflammatory, racist, homophobic, transphobic, and when they get pushed back, they act as if they're the first person to ever be criticised on this earth. And they, like, mule. Since I've been doing comedy, the pushback I've got has been because I existed. <laughs> and the pushback that I've got has been, like, often horrific online abuse that is completely disproportionate to me and that I am not the slightest bit unique in that like you add any other intersections of like race or um sexuality or or anything onto that and the abuse that people get for existing on stage is like uh, exponentially larger and so when people talk about like oh you can't talk about this on stage you can't do da 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 I'm like well, people can and they do, and it's boring and shit. <laughs> like, so for me, um, I think often the debate is about that, but the truth of the matter is the people who experience the most pushback get it just for existing and not for what they've said or didn't say. I also think with comedy, sometimes people like to imagine that comedy only exists to, like, upset the apple cart and destroy sacred cows and I think comedy is so big and beautiful it's like art like some of art exists to provoke and some of art exists to hurt but it's so big you know comedy exists to be stupid and light and loving and connective and baffling and unexpected it, it, it's so it can be anything. So I'm always very wary when somebody starts saying, well, the point of comedy is to insult everyone. And I'm like, that's so dull and small and like at one tiny viewpoint. Um, I also think, however, that there is an interesting debate around kind of as we become more sensitive or try to be more sensitive, how does that affect comedy? And what does it mean for comedy? Because I definitely have seen in the past 15 years, there'd have been jokes that I would have made 15 years ago that had a certain cruelty to them. Not in, like, not in any sort of terms of offensiveness or anything like that, but had a certain kind of cynicism or sneering or cruelty to them in one way or another. And definitely I look at them and think like, oh, wow, like people were so harsh then because they felt that they were being ironic and it was all contained. And I think comedy does reflect the society of the time. And as times move, you can look back and be like, Ugh, that seems completely wrong now. Like, I think 
in the 90s and the early 2000s, a lot of TV comedy was so secure that fascism was just on the fringes that they felt that if that any way of taking the piss of, out of it was fine because the general consensus was these oh, this is irrelevant and will never harm us. You know, whether or not that was like naive at the time is is one thing. But I think now people are like, no, this is scary. I, I couldn't possibly have that kind of jokes. And so again, like I think in some ways, if you're trying to be truly sensitive to people, it probably is harder to be a comedian now because you don't you want to try and see how you can target no one and like see and there'll be people out there who really disagree with me on that there'll be people who are like oh like no everyone should just toughen up but for me personally like my dream would to be do things that to be able to do things that were joyful and loving and inclusive and so that's kind of what I want to work towards how about that example that you um mentioned earlier on Josie about watching trying to watch The Life of Brian or thinking about watching The Life of Brian or not being allowed to watch The Life of Brian with your dad. And that that whole sort of like religious comedy thing, people perhaps of a certain religious type of mindset, perhaps not being able to accommodate comedy. What do I think? I think that actually people love jokes. People of all religions love jokes i also would say that on the whole yeah i think that like religious people that i know have a good sense of humor and it's you know obviously there's going to be some religious people who are very cruel and dogmatic and powerful who like give that a bad a bad name but like you know going to green belt everyone loved it they were great <laughs> i mean i don't know it's it's complicated isn't it like yeah. people care about the things they care about yeah yeah, yeah. So, so can i talk to you a bit more about when your experience of coming to green belt um i think it was in 2015 what did you think of it how was it oh i loved it it was so nice and i was with james acaster who's my friend uh and <laughs> um, yeah uh sort of i think introduced me to it because it's round by where he's from isn't it it's in Wellingborough isn't it yeah Um, I I loved it because the atmosphere is so gentle and to me um, I get a lot of like inspiration and heart from that like I am somebody who basically I really admire the Quakers and I want to be one but I'm not going to be getting up at nine on a Sunday morning and if I am I'm going to be doing childcare. no I'm it's it's sort of a long disappointment in my life that I don't manage to participate better um and so getting someone like that where you see all these people whose uh religion extends beyond kind of themselves and their immediate environment outwards in a spirit of like giving and activism in a sort of truly Christian way is very nice to me (laughs) partly because I was like brought up a Christian and I do still love a lot of the um tenets of Christianity and because I mean obviously I believe that Jesus was a socialist so it all links up for me in my own personal (laughs) schema of belief and uh, try and prove me wrong try and prove me wrong (laughs) it's harder for a rich man to enter the gates of heaven (laughs) You know, he's got it right there. It's on the page. Um, uh, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. It was a lovely, fun crowd, and it was such a fun thing to get to do. Your partner, um, Johnny from Johnny and the Baptists, um, it feels like those guys play most years now, and we love having them. Oh, my God, the they love it. Yeah, my partner, Johnny, Johnny and the Baptists, I mean, they've already got the name. They've got the name. <laughs> totally. Get them in. <laughs> They're on board. Yeah. Oh, they're no great. One will and again, it. like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're a Trojan horse of fun. Uh, we, I think, yeah, both of us, what we've got in common is that we like to try and be very friendly on stage. And we don't like the idea of trying to upset or alienate people unnecessarily. Paddy and Johnny were the ones who told me to do it. They were like, you'll love it. It's the best crowd. It's the sort of nice mums and dads who go to Woe Mad. but it is sort of a lot of it's kind of dream parents as well like uh sort of open-minded relaxed sort of christian parents the dream so nice so nice (laughs) earnest young people who just want to make the world better oh my god christian eco-socialists come on let's do it yeah. I, I'm going to play this this little section back to my boys when they come home from school, Josie. They, <laughs> they need to hear it. I'm a great dad. <laughs> but they'll be like, sorry, who is this? Who is this old person? <laughs> <laughs> 
how do you um uh, Catherine and I really scared each other this morning because uh, Catherine found this article at uh, an interview with Noam Chomsky in, in the New Statesman about how he is just so utterly fearful about the the moment that we're in right now from a point of view of the lack of democracy, the ecological crisis and the 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 the, the reemergence of the nuclear threat. And he's, he talks about those three things and he says this is absolute emergency. And we're thinking, oh, you know, it made us that despair that you talked about earlier on it made us oh my word and yet every artist that we speak to on this podcast seems to be curiously hopeful in some shape or form i mean how do you sustain that or you know do you how do you feel about the future josie on a local level i feel like britain really has mugged themselves and fucked it and i did everything that i could to try to change that but i am not a powerful person um i uh, i just did a show about having a child and worrying about climate change and i found a lot of kind of sucker from like a greta thunberg quote where they interviewed her in the guardian and they said to her how do you stay hopeful And she said, I don't care if what we're doing is hopeful, even if or even if it is completely hopeless, we must do what we can. And I loved it so much. And I had a bit on stage about how, like, that's what everyone needs. You don't need someone saying it'll all be all right. You need her being like, hope is bourgeois. Do the work. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, everything is very bad. And, you know, things are are very bad and I feel personally in the last 10 years it's been very clear to see things getting harder and the discourse toxifying and um control over the populace sort of ratcheting up in a way that I find disturbing and you know obviously ecological crisis yes it is very bad (laughs) Um, but like all you can do is try your hardest to keep going and to be useful in correcting that as best you can. That's all you can do. And it's better to do that than not. Like, it's never, ever better to succumb to inactivity and cynicism and despair because the best-case scenario, things do get better and you're a fucking misery. And otherwise you've had a miserable time the whole time getting there like if you can do whatever you can you will have a better time for it you'll influence people around you and you will build something now whether or not that's enough is heartbreaking you know like I'm not saying that you setting up a community garden will fix climate change yeah what I would say is it's the same old stuff it's like it's better not to be cynical because at the very worst, you will have had more fun in a horrific circumstance than everyone else. But like uh, at the best, you just don't know what you can do and what you can achieve. And, you know, someone like Greta Thunberg, like what a wonderful example, like a little girl on her own doing that, becoming this voice. So much is possible beyond what you might imagine. And it's just a case of like, not giving up and not succumbing to the worst parts of it acknowledging them of course like but not saying oh well that's that or even worse going oh well might as well be an asshole you know green belters and others who tune into this podcast how can they find you and support you and you know uh, listen in and help your work and your endeavors i'm i recorded my stand-up show tender which is about um giving birth and about climate change and pardon me i'm going to be releasing that in some capacity soon my stand-up show cara josephine which is about trying to move on from heartbreak that's coming out on amazon uh prime on the 3rd of december and that's available to watch i do a radio show called shortcuts yeah on Radio 4, and if they like that and want to support the show, please give it a five-star review on iTunes because that's the metrics by which it's judged. Um, Other than that, I have a Twitch channel that I periodically use, which is twitch.tv slash Josie underscore long. I have Twitter, but I don't recommend you follow it. It's absolute rubbish. Um, I have Instagram, but similarly, I don't use them well. I'm somebody who's been very turned off by uh, online, so I don't really... I'm not a very good content maker. Um, Other than that, uh, 
just keep an eye out because I will be doing bits and bobs and I'm, I'm writing quite a lot of stuff and hoping for the best. And if they want to financially support me, I have co-fee.com slash Josie Long. And donations are always welcome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just hoping that eventually I can write a new stand-up show and take it around. I yeah. know we hope we're hoping that everything goes back to normal soon. I miss live gigs and live comedy oh, and theatre. You guys must have missed the festival so much. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. My friend runs Salas Festival and he's just gutted. And normally he moans about it and he was like, "Oh, I a whole part of my life is so bad, isn't it? I'm sorry." Yeah. It's such a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think next year we'll go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> in some to. shape or form. <laughs> yeah, in some shape or form, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we wish you all the best with your move to Scotland as well. And I'm, I'm so many of us attempted to, to so make jealous. that same journey. Yeah. I mean, I think I I feel a bit like a paranoid prepper, but I'm also like, fuck it, I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> oh well done you're you're the advanced party you're the brave sort of like early adopters you're doing yeah or the canary in the coal canary mine. in the coal <laughs> <laughs> thank cool. you thank you oh, so thanks, much guys. thanks for your time oh, it's my pleasure cheers i'll see you later thank you thanks Bye. Bye. Okay. so that was josie long what did you think about that paul Oh, it's great. I, st- <laughs> I still sort of catch myself when we do these podcast recordings and we use this thing called Squadcast, which is an online platform. And our guests come up, we see them in their rooms or their little lockdown places, wherever they're recording from. And I still get a real buzz. I think, hold on, Josie Long's name is on the screen. Hold on, it's Josie Long. We're talking to <laughs> Josie Long. It was a real buzz to be able to just chat to her. And she was so down to earth. Yeah, she's great. And, you know, what's interesting about Josie is she's kind of known as this cult optimist. And there's a real sense that it's not just about being optimistic, but she's like, she's doing stuff. Like, I think, what was that quote that she said? Hope is bourgeois, do the work. Like, yeah. you know, regardless of whether we think this is going to end up good or bad, it's not really, it's not really a choice not to do the work. Do the work, make things better, keep going, don't give up. We don't have the luxury of giving up. I love that tag of her being a, a cult optimist, but I felt that she was really, really down to earth and realistic <laughs> yeah, as well. I did too. <laughs> I love that section where she was bantering a little bit with you about, you know, these people who get up at five o'clock in the morning, write down all their dreams, do some sort of power exercise, then, you know, blend up some kale and get on with the day. And she, she was sort of, she was like, nah, no, nah, no, no. <laughs> she wasn't that sort of like power driven Uh, person at all was she (laughs) no very realistic (laughs) which is refreshing she talked about you know if if you'd have told her i think she said if if someone had told her 10 years ago that young people would be out campaigning and leading the way in questioning the whole market capital economy and really leading the way in protesting about climate emergency and climate change she just said oh yeah that's a lovely idea i love that idea but she wouldn't have believed it was true and i she said it was one of the most beautiful things in her life at the moment was seeing that uprising of young people to demand change i thought that was really good yeah we've we've cut we've made strides that is true you know 10 15 years ago would people have cared about the environmental issues that we do now would would they be have chewed in to what a capitalist society looks like and maybe not and it's a slightly i guess it's slightly double-edged that because in part things are getting so bad and they're particularly so bad for young people that you sort of you have to do something <laughs> What about that thing she said, um, Jesus was a socialist? I think Jesus was a socialist. Absolutely. I think he was a he was the original rebel. He was. Common purse, everything in common, you know. It's pretty socialist, mm-hmm. isn't it? We always get into trouble when at uh, Greenbelt we give the impression of, you know, having a particular political leaning because of the the faith aspect of the festival. But you know, at the end of the day it's unavoidable, isn't it? He was a socialist. <laughs> well was he?
And, but anyway, we're, we're losing Josie from, from England. Um, she's moving. She's going to Scotland. What do you think about that, Catherine? It's a great idea, isn't it? It's very tempting, isn't it? Every, given everything that's going on. I hear a lot, a lot of my friends have been exploring that idea. It wouldn't be useful for the festival. It would be tricky. Um, I mean, perhaps you could go and throw your weight behind and your creative energies into Solas Festival, which is like our sister festival in Scotland. Yeah, Josie mentioned that as well, didn't she? She did. Yeah, she's performed at Solas and she's really good friends with uh, some of the people who helped put the programme together. So her and Johnny and their little girl are off up to Glasgow to live. So we wish them all the best and we anticipate that there might be a few other green belters who will be following them over the next few years. Who knows? Who knows? Oh, there's always Good Enough Island. I can imagine Good Enough Island as being a remote island off the west coast of Scotland somehow. You know what, actually, Paul? There is already a Good Enough Island. I've just remembered. It's off Tasmania. It's already existing. Really? Yeah, it exists. So it's right on the other side of the world. Well, we better get planning. You're going to have to have some sort of live music venue on Good Enough Island. It's just going to be one long gig. Is yeah. yeah. What permanent? Yeah. Just going to have constant, constant background music of the live performance going on at all times. Going right the way through, a bit like that first Woodstock when Jimi Hendrix came on stage as the sun was coming yes. up. Yes, exactly like Woodstock, actually. <laughs> You know, Josie, as well as mentioning, mentioning Solas Festival, she also mentioned a couple of people that we have at the festival. She mentioned Danny Dawling and Bilal Zafar, both firm festival favourites. Yeah, and for me, I love those connections because it seems to bear out this community that we talked about that we're trying to create, that we want artists to feel like they can belong with us and be part of the community. And when I, when I see those connections or hear those connections, I think, yeah, yeah, it's starting to work or it's not starting to work. It is a reality. These connections and this movement happens way beyond the festival, happens way beyond the field and those four days in August. This is a movement of people who are creating and making work and living and resisting and just trying to make the world a better place and we're just a part of it. So uh, that was a, a really heartwarming conversation. I, I felt really, I, I felt better for that chat with, with Josie. I mean, the, the world is a difficult place right now and I felt like chatting with Josie really, really cheered me up. You know what? I don't know whether it made me feel uh, better, but what it made me feel is uh, doesn't matter if I feel better carry on <laughs> that's what it made me feel like you know stop wallowing over how you feel and you got to do it she said that you know the life of a performer the life of a comedian is sort of 90 percent rejection 90 percent being told oh no there's someone else that's better oh no that joke's not very good and you just have to toughen up and get on with it um i thought wow yeah yeah you know the life of an artist is does incorporate a lot of pushback um but just get on, just get on, just get on. Yeah. Yeah, I think you need to be a very particular kind of person that can can go through that. Especially, you know, she said she said started performing at the age of 13, 14. Imagine being on stage. I guess people wouldn't heckle you as hard, maybe, as if you're starting to do career in comedy at the age of 22. But yeah, you need to, you need to be made of strong stuff to withstand that kind of... You know, if, if anybody looks at me bad, it affects me for about two days. So, <laughs> and What I like about that is it hasn't bred a real toughness. It hasn't bred a real I don't care-ness about her. She still really, really deeply cares and she's a tender person. Uh, yeah, resilient, but also tender. Well, as Jesus the socialist said, as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. Direct quote. You get all your biblical quotes <laughs> here, yeah. So thank you very much for joining us again for episode two of Somewhere to Believe in podcast. Next week, we've got the wonderful poet, educator, workshop leader, activist, artist, Manira Pilgrim on there with us. Yeah, that was an amazing conversation. Um, can't wait to share that with you. So if you want to keep in touch with us, uh, please write in and tell us your thoughts on this episode or answer any of the questions that we've asked you on the episode. And you can do that using our email address, which is... Uh, stbi at greenbelt.org.uk 
And if you want to sign up to any general festival news about Greenbelt Festival so we can let you know about how things are going, you can sign up to our weekly dispatches email newsletter on our website. Out and about on socials, we are at Greenbelt on Twitter and at Greenbelt Festival on Instagram and Facebook. So please let us know what you're thinking on your platform of choice. Massive thank you for Josie Long for sit- giving us some of her time for this podcast. And thank you to Daisy Ware Jarrett in the office for producing us and Paul Truman for helping us frame the episode. And to Josh and Jake on our volunteer recorded talks team who do all the polishing and make us sound half decent before we release this. They're wonderful. We also obviously chatted to Josie ahead of the US election and by the time this podcast comes out, the US election will have happened. You know, Paul, if I was going to be a dictator... (laughs) Is there something you need to tell me, Catherine? (laughs) Well, what I've what I've realised is if I was going to be a really bad kind of person in power, then all you have to do is keep everybody really happy because it's when people things get hard for people that that's when they start causing problems for people in power and dictatorships. If they're happy, people let things carry on mostly, won't they? It's when things get hard that people go, "What's going on here? Why doesn't this feel good? What needs changing?" So. Yeah, so I just I'd focus on keeping people happy under my dictatorship. (laughs) I'll remind you of that when you are in dictatorship. Um, Good enough island. Yeah, on your island. Good enough island. Yeah, must remember. (laughs) I've renamed it now from Greenbelt Island to Good Enough Island. It's already happened. Good Enough Island. (laughs) It, it's happening. I th- I'm worried about this, and I'm I'm pretty sure all those people have already written to us to say they're they're coming to the island are pretty much changing their minds now. Um, they didn't sign up for a dictatorship. Tell them not to worry about it. I'll, I'll give them some. <laughs> I'll give them some free chocolate on arrival. <laughs> <laughs>